South Africa, a whole world in a single country, above sea and below, at the coast and inland. However you choose to travel, a land full of life and adventure awaits. There is something for everyone. On the journey, you'll come face to face with the Big Five. You'll find hospitality and wine, history and culture. And learn life's most important lesson, how to relax and have fun as we explore South Africa, where the welcome is as warm as the weather. Come and find the ultimate journey in a breathtaking country. The city of Cape Town immediately sets the scene, flanked by the Atlantic Ocean on the one side and Table Mountain on the other. This must surely be one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Cape Tonians reflect the city's mood, laid back but full of life. This relaxed mood has not stopped Cape Town from evolving into a booming metropolis. Foreign investors, the film industry and tourism have all contributed to Cape Town's success. There's something to suit everyone. Adrenaline junkies from around the world flock to Bloberg Beach to try the newest water sport craze, kite surfing. Some make it look easy, but novices of all ages soon realize how difficult it really is. Visitors Anya and Angela have leapt at the chance to train with one of the circuit pros. They're delighted to escape the cold European weather, keen to try kite surfing, and thrilled to check out the local talent. Professional surfer Henning Knockel is already on the water training. And what a show it is. The girls seem less sure about tackling the waves now, but conditions here are perfect. The notorious southeaster wind blows off Table Mountain, creating everything a surfer needs. Blustery winds, sunshine and warm weather. Henning's skills have made him famous in the kite surfing world, and he regularly appears in magazines, on television and in films. His stunning acrobatics reflect years of practice and hard work in the waves. Henning, who's German, spends so much time kite surfing here that he has made Cape Town his second home. As well as generating ideal conditions, Table Mountain also provides a stunning backdrop for his stunts. Henning is a familiar face in kite surfing competitions and the girls are suitably impressed with his daring skills. Enough watching from the sidelines. Now it's time for some audience participation. Once in the water, Henning demonstrates the basics. He begins with the basic body dragging technique. You have to master this before even thinking of strapping on a board. It's fun, but the girls leave Henning to do what he does best. He finishes with a few impressive stunts. Kite surfing can be quite dangerous. Surfers can reach speeds of up to 77 kilometers an hour. Those who land badly or who hit the sand or even another surfer can suffer serious injury. The girls have had a great day at the beach and can tick off their first adventure. But there are quite a few still to come, so they head off in search of the next thrill. Two hours outside Cape Town, Walker Bay glows in the early morning light. For some of South Africa's most magnificent animals, this warm, shallow bay acts as more than a beauty spot. It's also a massive birthing pool. 
Anya and Angela join other passengers for a trip out into the bay, hoping to catch sight of some of these gigantic mums and their enormous infants. The pregnant giants swim in from the cold Antarctic into the shallow warm bay between June and December, and tourists come to visit one of the most famous maternity units in the world. Anya and Angela soon spot the first mother, a southern right whale. By her side, a newborn baby, seven meters long. It will drink about 600 liters of milk a day. Like all babies, it's very playful and performs a tiny baby-sized tail slap. The whales swim slowly just beyond the shoreline. giving the girls plenty of chance to watch their gentle acrobatics. The other tricks include dramatic flipper slaps, lob tails, headstands and fluke waves. The white growths or callosities form when the skin thickens in patches around the head. It's a natural process that all right whales go through. Tiny crustaceans called whale lice live on the callosities, making them appear white, pink, yellow, or even orange. Anya and Angela couldn't have hoped for a better encounter. The whales seem comfortable swimming close to the boat, leaving them all with some unforgettable memories. And there's more wildlife to come. On the way back, the boat passes Giza Island and its resident colony of about 6,000 Cape fur seals. The water appears to boil with activity. These waters are known as Shark Alley because the seals provide rich pickings for the local great white sharks. The sharks simply cruise through, picking off seals as though from a drive-through takeaway. The sharks are keeping a low profile today though, and the seals can relax. Needing to recover from the morning's excitement, the girls head for some rest and relaxation. They've booked into Grootbos with a bungalow in a unique location. Bang in the middle of a private nature reserve. If the spectacular views don't take their breath away, the inside of the bungalow certainly will. The place absolutely oozes five-star luxury. Their private balcony looks out over some of South Africa's richest vegetation. Called Fainbos, it teems with plants and animals found nowhere else in the world. The girls soon discover that sleeping in the African wilderness can include serious pampering. They quickly settle in and refresh themselves, one with a bath, the other with a nap. The day ends with sundowners and a serenade from the local nightlife. In the morning, the girls meet the latest additions to the Grootbos family. Grootbos has its own stables with 17 well-trained horses. When this foal is old enough, it will join them. For now though, its only job is to look cute and be adored, which it does very well. Anya and Angela's guide leads them through the Fainbos. This floral Eden stretches for more than a thousand hectares. It boasts an extraordinary richness and diversity of species. More than 650 native plants grow here, including 12 of the 17 species of the ancient proteas. It's a botanist's dream. After a slow walk to get used to the horses, the girls feel ready for a canter. Oh, okay. 
Revived by a short rest, they decide to do another ride, this time on the dunes of Walker Bay. These horses are specially trained to walk through the deep, loose sand. Panoramic views seem to stretch forever. Anya and Angela spend the afternoon exploring the endless miles of deserted coastline. They finish off by the shore, where the horses can gallop on the hard, wet sand. With the sun on their skin, salt on their lips, and the wind in their hair, the girls feel like movie stars in a Hollywood romance. There's no time for daydreaming, though. They're on another mission, to find a protea, South Africa's exquisite national flower. Named after a Greek god, proteas first appeared 300 million years ago. These ones grow near a magical place called the Milkwood Forest. Many rare lichen and moss species also thrive in this forest, cloaking the ancient Milkwood trees. And here's the champion of this place, botanical expert Tulani Silence and Glovu. Most of the plants which you will find here are unique within the forest. Um, like ironwood, stinkwood, so you don't find them in fainbos. The moment you see them, then you know you are in the zone of the Miku forest. Tulani is an expert on this area and regularly speaks abroad, raising awareness about the unique plants found in this extraordinary corner of South Africa. Here we're standing in a big milkwood tree, which um, you can see branches are going sideways. Like I said earlier, they uh, create an umbrella shape, mm -hmm. and that is their adaptation to survive strong wind. And another important thing is that they need sunlight, so they have to expand and uh, push away other trees so that they can get as much sunlight as possible. Some of these trees are several hundred years old. The moss growing on the bark helps the milkwood attract more sunlight. Because of their green color, they are cooked their own. <laughs> the plants found in this forest are symbiotic, each one helping another to thrive, a genuine community of mutual support. Wow, look at this lichen. This is called Old Man's Beard. Indication that the air is not polluted, it's clean air. So while you're still here, you can basically breathe the air because it is um, clean. And it's called old man's beard because it looks like beard. <laughs> <laughs> People used to think they are parasitic because if you look at the top, wherever they grow, it is actually dry. So they grow on the dead part and they are not responsible for the death of these branches. It's just that the branch um, is dead and then there is enough sunlight coming through. Otherwise, if they grow in the leaves, then they don't get, they don't get the sun, then they starve and they die. Tulani is the best kind of guide, a local academic. As well as being a trained botanist, he also has a wealth of knowledge from growing up in the area and his sharp eyes don't miss a thing. This is a rain spider nest. So the rain spider takes all the leaves, it puts them together, and then it, it um, uh, covers them by the spider webs, and then it lays the eggs inside. And lots and lots of eggs because there is, wow, you're talking about thousands. Because, because there is a high mortality rate. Yeah. Yeah, there is no parental care, so lots of them will not survive. Yes. So it wants to ensure the chances of surviving. It's moving. It's moving. Oh yeah, they're still walking yeah. around. Yeah. And they, they will basically make some small holes like this one. Yeah. yeah. So if you see small holes like that, then you know they are already out. If it is unable to dig out, it means that it is not strong enough to face life outside. Okay. Yeah, yeah. From the center of the mystical Milkwood Forest, it's hard to imagine that Walker Bay is just a stone's throw away. With its beautiful beaches, great wave action, and moderate wind, this is a perfect spot for surfing. So where are the surfers? Well, they avoid Walker Bay because it is already patrolled by another creature, 
one no surfer wants to encounter. Great white sharks. The safest place to be is on a boat, and the safest person to be with is a marine expert. Hi, I'm your white shark researcher. Swiss-born Michael Scholl knows what the sharks want. This would be a beautiful sushi, but not today. Today, the shark, it's the shark's turn to enjoy some food. We put engine covers over the outboard to protect the sharks from injuring themselves against the propellers and the engine. Sometimes, some sharks are very curious. Before long, the first sharks appear. As they take the bait, Michael snaps photographs of their dorsal fins, which helps him identify individuals for his research. Every shark sighting is systematically logged. The boat suddenly seems very small. Great white sharks can grow up to six meters long and may weigh in at more than two tons. Michael is not scared of the sharks, but fascinated because so little is known about their behavior. Basically with my research I look at which sharks come into the area, how long they stay, what size, what sex, uh, and then obviously I look at, at when they're coming back in the area, if there's any seasonality. Great whites often get a bad press, portrayed as vicious man-eaters. Michael's research helps dispel these myths, and the onboard entertainment keeps things light-hearted. When we wait for a shark and there's no sharks coming, well, we have our own band playing the Great White Shark song. If I was a great white, I wouldn't bite you, but I'd swim right next to you. If I was a great white, I wouldn't bite you, but I'd swim right next to you and ask you how you do. Then you'd look at me and pull out a harpoon and try and shoot me. Then I'd realize how f***ing really hungry I am right now. Sorry about your leg, I'll be back in a while for the rest. If I were a great white shark. His singing doesn't seem to put the sharks off. Meanwhile, back on land, Michael analyzes his data. This portion of the fin will change with time. It's like a flag in the wind, basically. But the big identification features will remain the same. And that's basically how I use it to identify. At the moment, they are protected in a few countries only around the world. South Africa was the first country to protect them in 91. So that is a big problem that we know those sharks move from South Africa to Australia via parts of Asia where their fins are very prized. Great white sharks are in rapid decline and they face a bleak future. Close encounters like the one Anya and Angela enjoy may soon become unheard of. Sharks face many threats to their survival, including hunting, shark nets and trawling. The population simply can't bounce back from such a high death rate because great whites reproduce very slowly. Females don't become sexually mature until they're 12 years old and they give birth only twice in their lifetime. So the great white shark is now in danger of becoming extinct. The girls, however, are lucky. Trips like these may become a thing of the past because unless we act now to protect them, we may find that the only thing that remains of the great white shark is a few thousand teeth and a fearsome reputation that is utterly undeserved. If we're not careful, they will fade out of the picture altogether. Life is precarious elsewhere too. Anya and Angela set off in search of different giants in the northeast. This time, their guides are tracker Eric McQuenya and ranger Rory Duplessis, who take them on safari to introduce them to the sights and sounds of the African bush. Oh. 
They're in Manuleti Game Reserve, which lay between several other reserves. In recent years, fences between these have come down, so that these individual protected areas have been rolled into one. The next development plan involves opening up this wilderness across international borders, as Rory explains. Manuleti means place of the stars, or a star in, in particular. It's the star Canopus. Manuleti is about 25,000 hectares, and if you consider that you have the Timbavati in the north, uh, Sabi Sands in the south, and then Kruger Park in the east, you have about 2.2 million hectares of, of wilderness area, which is amazing. And, and the big plan is to create a transfrontier park with ourselves, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe, where we double that 2.2 million hectares to about 4.5 million hectares. The fact that there are no fences means that animals that were previously boxed in can now roam more easily, restoring ancient migration paths once blocked by man-made boundaries. As well as the big five, lion, leopard, elephant, buffalo and rhino, there are also hundreds of birds, insects and other mammals. The best time to see them is early morning and late afternoon. Giraffes don't face any competition for the juicy topmost leaves of the acacia trees. They can eat up to 63 kilos of vegetation a day. They twist off the leaves with long, prehensile tongues and seem indifferent to the thorns. Hippos appear to spend their time lazily soaking and wallowing in the water. But don't be fooled, they can turn nasty. Hippos will not tolerate intruders on their patch. They can rush through the water at shocking speed to defend their territories, and their aggression makes them one of the most dangerous animals in the bush. Baboons, too, hide their aggressive streak, this time behind a cute, clown-like playfulness. They have a complex social structure and use grooming to strengthen the bonds between them. Males get kicked out of the group once they reach sexual maturity, but females will stay with the same group their entire lives. There's so much to see everywhere they look. Anya and Angela spot something new. As they head back to camp, Rory notices a pride of lions heading towards some grazing buffalo. The girls may be in for an age-old showdown between these two kings of the bush. They wait patiently to see if anything will happen. A confrontation like this can go either way, especially as the lions have cubs with them, and buffaloes are known to target the young ones. The atmosphere is tense as the lioness assumes her hunting position. But today is not the day, as the buffalo run off and the lions don't even attempt to chase. Nevertheless, this will be a good story to tell back home. Hopefully, their adventure will encourage others to visit. South Africa's economy depends greatly on parks like these, both private and state-owned. As far back as the early 1900s, South Africa recognized the need to protect its natural heritage. It established several game reserves, the biggest and most well-known being the Kruger National Park. The country has established itself as a world leader in park management and conservation. These lions may well relax. The food is fresh and plentiful, and their habitat free from the threats of development or hunting. Tourists like Anya and Angela can enjoy seeing wild animals close up 
while staff such as Eric and Rory help manage the reserve in ways that best meet the interests of both the wildlife and the visitors. These guides are highly trained professionals with an intimate knowledge of the animals and plants found here. And they really dazzle with some staggering facts yeah. and figures. When they come across a herd of elephants, they explain to the girls that elephants have massive appetites and need to eat about 200 kilograms of vegetation a day. Anya and Angela see for themselves how an elephant can strip a tree in minutes. This leads to all sorts of problems for the environment, like deforestation and erosion. Much of the elephant's food passes straight through their system, which suits the local dung beetles just fine. They love the stuff and lay their eggs in fresh droppings. They may roll their precious cargo for miles to find suitable nesting sites, recycling the bushway. Rory invites the girls to take a closer look as he dishes the dirt on dung beetles. But these adventure-loving girls don't seem that keen to deal with droppings. Okay. They push with their back legs and the front, the front part, their mouth parts have been modified to dig yeah. into the sand and the soil. Yes, yeah, they have really like... Yes. You want to try? Mm, I mean, mm. <laughs> just hold again. <laughs> What's happening here is dung beetles are busy collecting the dung, rolling it up into a ball in which the female will then lay a single egg. They then roll it off and then dig a hole and mm -hmm. then submerge the, the egg into that hole and then cover it up. This nutrient-rich nesting material is such a precious resource that the first dung beetles fly in within minutes of it landing on the ground. Okay, he's away. They're always after the freshest pile and in a few hours we'll move on to the next. The girls have spent several hot, dusty hours out here, and now they can't wait to get back to camp. Not for them the canvas and candles camping experience. They want luxury. Many of the game reserves caught on very quickly that although tourists want the full bush experience, they still want to come home to running water and a comfortable bed. So many of these camps offer every comfort and more. Clever design combines a modern African-style interior with a rustic look that blends into the bush. The balcony looks straight out over a waterhole. The girls can spend hours watching life go by with their picture postcard African setting. But the animals are still wild. It wouldn't be safe for the girls to venture out here alone, no matter how hot it gets. So the lodge has built its visitors their very own watering hole. Rory shows them around. Well, Tinswala means blessing in Shangan, which is the local, the local language. And we do hope to give every guest that comes here some sort of a blessing. We want to provide them with great food, great accommodation, a wonderful game experience, and above all, the best service that they could ever want. The only problem with such luxury is that the girls may find it hard to tear themselves away. After all, they're beginning to learn how to relax to the max. They manage to drag themselves away from the bed, but only get as far as the pool. They couldn't ask for a more spectacular view. Manuleti happens to be very close to the Blyder River Canyon, part of the famous Drakensberg mountain range. A 26 kilometer long, 800 meter deep canyon carved into the red sandstone offers plenty of activities for the thrill seeker. Anya and Angela feel ready for some off-road action. The moment the girls put their goggles on, their wild side shoots free.
Earl, their guide, can hardly keep up. When they stop, Angela realizes exactly why these are called dirt cars. Bitten by the bug, they opt for more speed, this time on quad bikes. Carl literally can't see them for dust. Anya is beginning to look like a woman possessed. Oh, the girls handled themselves very well. They uh, started off slow, but turned out to be a very good trip. I'm uh, glad they enjoyed it. Give me five for <laughs> After a quick clean-up, the girls go to one of the local Shangan villages, where they've been invited to see a traditional dance. This performance owes its roots to traditional ceremonies during which the dancers go into a trance, hoping to communicate with their ancestors. It's a catchy and hypnotizing show for spectators too, both young and old. Afterwards, the girls have a chance to find out more. And there are special dances for special occasions? So yes, and special ages, young boys will do certain dances. The, the older ladies will do certain dances, the men do dances as well. Some are traditional songs, some are traditional dances, some are about war, some are about peace. So it's, it's very involved, it's a long traditional and it's a, it's, a, it's a huge cultural following that they have. It's, a, it's an old, old thing that came back from 400 years ago. Two traditional healers, called Sangomas, try to predict the future of the two tourists. First, they pump themselves up with dance, music and singing. Sangomas do the local equivalent of reading tea leaves or looking into a crystal ball. The message comes to them loud and clear. Though the girls remain skeptical, the fact remains that ceremonial events like these play an important role in the life of the local communities. It's all part of the South African experience, as different cultures mingle and merge. It's getting late. Time to go back to camp. But there's a treat in store. they bump into a massive herd of elephants visiting from Kruger National Park. Now that the fences have been dropped, it's very common for animals to cross over from one game reserve to another in search of the juiciest vegetation and the best water holes. Seeing a herd like this gives a unique insight into elephant behavior the girls can see how the different individuals respond to each other, communicating through subtle body language and low rumbles. Elephants spend most of their time eating, about 16 hours a day just feeding. The matriarch leads the herd to water holes she remembers from her own childhood along routes that these youngsters in turn will remember for the rest of their lives, perhaps by storing and retrieving memories of the sights, sounds and smells of this area. Rangers and trackers can read the animal's body language and know how to stay safe. It all boils down to mutual respect. The animals are completely fine with us. They've become habituated or they've become used to vehicles. 
As long as we don't stand up, make too much noise, they will be completely fine with the vehicle. That lioness has got a piercing gaze. But the girls must put their trust in Rory. As long as everyone stays seated, the lions will keep away. To give them a thrill, however, the lioness obliges with a short snarl. And, for extra effect, assumes the pounce pose. And her mate musters up enough energy to sit up and stare too, just to add to the sense of occasion. Time to leave the king to his jungle. Anya and Angela have been lucky. They've seen the big five, as well as much else. And now they're ready to head south again towards Cape Town. But first, they will end their safari with a glass of wine, a traditional sundowner underneath Africa's big, beautiful sky. From dry and dusty to wet and windy, their next stop couldn't be more different. A large section of the Cape Peninsula has been set aside to protect the unique fauna and flora found on this part of the coastline. It's not often you see wild ostriches against an ocean backdrop. Many ships have been wrecked here at the Cape of Storms, sending hundreds of sailors to a rough, watery grave. The only bodies in the sea today are northern right whales, which swim in to spend the summer months here, mating and giving birth. This part is often wrongly thought of as the southernmost part of Africa. But Cape Town is the most southern metropolis, and the best way to see it is from a helicopter. <laughs> Their pilot starts off by flying over the harbour and the VNA waterfront. Then he takes them towards the city's dramatic mountain backdrop. He inches over Lion's Head, one of the many landmarks, then over the flat-topped Table Mountain Plateau, more than a thousand meters high. On the other side lies the sinister-looking Devil's Peak. From further away, the girls have a perfect view of the iconic Table Mountain. And of course, no trip to Cape Town would be complete without going up Table Mountain. There are various footpaths to the top, but tourists on a time budget can get there in two and a half minutes by taking the cable car. It's a perfect day, and the views stretch all the way to the ocean. Local guides Inga and Jutta point out Robben Island, where Nelson Mandela was held prisoner. The local rock hyraxes, or dasses, ignore the tourists and get on with their sunbathing. Table Mountain has a weather system all of its own. It can change from sunshine to a thick mist the locals call the tablecloth in a matter of minutes. This area is protected because of its rare fainboss. There are 1,500 plant species growing on the mountain alone. <laughs> the girls took the easy route, but for the braver, there is a more adventurous ascent. But they wouldn't have been able to carry up this little treat had they chosen the harder route. Inga and Jutta know how to put on a picnic. Cheers. 
Inge and Jutta want to show them much more of Cape Town. The first stop is a colorful area called Burkarp. Today, the brightly restored houses and local culture are a feature tourists shouldn't miss. But the cheerful atmosphere paints over a bleak history. Most of the residents descend from slaves brought to the country from the Indonesian archipelago almost 500 years ago by the Dutch East India Company. After a good look round, the girls then head to Devatakant, Cape Town's trendy artist's quarter. Angela and Anya are booked into one of the little townhouses with a rooftop balcony and every comfort catered for. The townhouse is close to the center as well as the beach and Cape Town's many other attractions. Orange juice is all very well, but Anya and Angela are ready for something stronger. Inga and Jutta have planned their tour well. It's time to head out of Cape Town to a nearby vineyard. The mild Cape climate is ideal for the vines and the French Huguenots established a wine culture here many hundreds of years ago. Most wine farms are built in the Cape Dutch tradition and offer fascinating tours and guided wine tastings. Although South Africa's winemaking history dates back almost 350 years, it's very much an emerging market, but already accounts for about 3% of the world's wine. Most of the vineyards now have comfortable wine tasting rooms with friendly knowledgeable staff, often with an on-site restaurant and shop. In the vast cellars, the wine matures within massive oak barrels. Oak gives the wine a spicy flavor and allows for just the right amount of oxidation to take place. Different kinds of oak produce different kinds of effects on the wine. One of the most popular grape varieties grown in South Africa is the Cabernet Sauvignon grape. The Cape climate is ideal for this variety. The leaf looks so sinister. It's called devil's leaf. Anya and Angela have realized that it would be hard to tire of Cape Town because there's always something to do. From the laid-back street life and mountain backdrop to the harbor and seafront, Cape Town's delights crop up at every corner. The girls are learning to take things easy. On the other side of the footbridge, they stop to find out more about the rhythm of life here. The singing and dancing, enough to bring a smile to any face. The hustle and bustle doesn't disturb the Cape fur seals that have made the waterfront their home. Live and let live, that seems to be Cape Town's motto, and the fur seals seem happy with that. Anya and Angela's trip is nearly over but they won't leave without buying a few souvenirs. With more than 300 stores and craft markets nearby, they're spoiled for choice.
Compared to most European countries, South Africa is relatively cheap. They'll easily pick up a few bargains to remind them of their extraordinary visit. The girls decide to spend their last evening in South Africa, in Camps Bay. This is where the young and beautiful congregate after work each afternoon. This is one of the trendiest parts of town. But it's not until they see the views that they realize why. On one side of the bay, the sun sets over the Atlantic. On the other, the mountain range known as the Twelve Apostles looms over the beachfront. Looking around, Anya and Angela see that the locals here, too, are experts at serious relaxing and socializing. And they decide to do the same and spend the rest of their final evening chilling out in one of the coolest places around. As they watch their last South African sunset, they recall some of the highlights of their fascinating trip. From the amazing activities, wonderful sea life to the breathtaking scenery and unique plant life the girls won't forget their South African adventure the wildlife was more than they could have hoped for the weather warm and the welcome warmer They tasted adventure and speed. Yippee! The freedom of horse riding and the peace of the beach. The beauties of Cape Town captured their imagination and the memories will last forever. From its views and sounds, to its scents and tastes, South Africa deserves a toast. Their salute to an ultimate journey. <laughs>